Hello, Ron Rukowski. Yeah, hello, Dirk Pointer. How you doing? <laughs> good. I'm doing good. Um, so, Ron, I know you from 30 years ago when I started at the, it was then Northeast, Northeast Missouri State, and now it's Truman State University. And I started in the theater department, and you were the technical director for the theater department. That's correct. And you just retired uh, last year? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the reason I thought this would be a good fit, and, and we kind of reconnected on a, on a group Zoom with our, um, some people that I went to school with, and you were, you were their professor and teacher. And um, Are you a professor? I don't know if that's the an official. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. Yeah. So, um, and I thought, man, you know what? You have had, and I know you don't think about it like this, and that's fine, but the influence you've had on so many people over a 30 plus year time span at Truman State University, uh, the people just that I went to school with, I know that it ranges from teachers to people that build sets for plays, to people that do lighting design, to people that build sets. Um, one of our guys, Andy Berry, builds the sets for the, the uh, Nightmare, Nightmare before Christmas, the, uh, those animatronic, uh, I, I, I can't think of the word, but he builds those tiny sets for those movies. Right, right. Um, up to, you know, I went to school with, with Jenna Fisher, and she's a big star, and she started a scholarship in your name here about a year ago. Right, right. So I thought it would be really great to talk to you, and, and your story could be out there for anybody that had studied with you and, and, and was influenced by you at Truman State or otherwise. And, and that's why I asked you to come on and talk. All right. Well, it's my pleasure being here. This is great. All right. Well, well let's jump in. So first, tell me about um, early Ron. So what got you interested in theater? And then what got you interested in being a, a teacher or a college professor? Well, probably early, early. It, it had a lot to do with my, my dad. Um, because as a kid, I, I was always by his side, and he was always doing things around the house, little projects. And um, one of the things that he had done was he built a clubhouse in the backyard for for all of us. There, there's I have uh, three brothers and a sister. And uh, of course, this is way long ago, and uh, Dad didn't even have any power tools, so we built this entire thing with an actual handsaw and and uh, hammer and nails, and that was it. And so I, I had uh, developed a love for construction at that time. And the other big interest that he had that I kind of followed in suit was um, model railroads. He always had a layout in the house, which uh, I was always fascinated with the miniatures. And I always was helping him. Of course, when I was you know, 10, 11, he wouldn't let me touch anything. Um, but I, I remember one time I had built a, a factory at, uh, and I, I, it was painstaking. I mean, I worked so hard on this. And I remember coming to him and said, can we put this on the layout? And then he looked it over. He says, this one we can put on the layout. And it was like, oh, my gosh. So that, that was a, a huge moment in my life when I, actually one of my things was on the layout. And so I think that he really, at that point, unknowingly, was getting me prepared for all the things that I was going to be doing in life uh, with construction and model building and, and uh, the research and creativity and uh, which, you know, that's what I did as a scene designer. You know, I looked at different, uh, different shows, obviously, in different eras and different places. And uh, you got to do the research. Yeah. And then you got to build this to make it look like that's where you're, where you are. And so, yeah, I, I don't think he knew that it, what he was doing because he really wanted me to follow in his footsteps because uh, he was a phototypographer. He was, uh, first, he did advertising, and he was a, 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 a typesetter. And um, so my two older brothers, they followed in his footsteps, uh, but I had these other dreams of, of being, uh, being a performer. Because in uh, high school, I got very involved. I was actually very lucky because my junior high had a drama department. I know a lot of junior highs don't have a department. They may do plays and stuff, but we actually had a department. 
and uh, where we did uh, shows every year. And so starting in seventh grade, I started to do this. And uh, so it was an easy jump getting into high school that, oh yeah, I want to continue doing this. And uh, I remember it was my senior year in high school. And of course, you know, you want to be in the show. And I, I was casting a lot of shows. I, I enjoyed being on stage, but I also helped backstage because of what my dad had taught me with the construction. And it was my senior year, the senior play, and uh, I get the script and I'm looking over my, my part and I see that my part actually dies on page one. <laughs> like, what do you mean, wait, 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 I, I wanted a part. And that's when my drama teacher had come and said, well, Ron, I was really hoping that you would design and build the sets. Which is like, wow, I never thought about that. But of course, how I'd love to do that. And the, the show was The Cat and the Canary. So it took place in this uh, old uh, Elizabethan mansion and it had secret passages and all sorts of stuff. So I had to create props. Uh, there was a clock that you had to pull out or twist the number nine on the clock and it opened up a passage door. I mean, it was all sorts of fun things like that, which I had to create. Um, so that was, that was pretty cool. And then uh, that final summer, uh, for the, the musical, uh, we were doing Carousel. And again, uh, he'd asked if I would design the sets, which I said, sure, and I did. And um, a scout, if you want to call it, from a, a college, a private college, Whittier College, had come to see the show, and uh, specifically to see the work that I had done. And um, he uh, pulled me afterwards, and said, uh, we were wondering if you'd like to, to come to Whittier College. And if you do, we'd like to give you a job where we want you to be the, uh, the shop intern in, in the theater department. So that's how I took the jump from high school into college. So right away, your freshman year, you walk in as an intern and you're working in the shop at a, at a college? Yeah, which was pretty scary uh, because there were uh, a lot of students there. They were actually like in their 30s. And here I am, you know, Mr. 19-year-old telling them what they should do or shouldn't do in the shop. At first, I was a little intimidated by it, but then I realized, no, they, they really didn't know what they were doing. So it was okay for me to kind of show them the ropes. And, um, but, you know, my, my ambition still at that whole time was uh I, i'm going to be going to the studios i i want to i want to work on movies i want to do you know film and things like that and um i i had uh met some people um that kind of helped get that idea going as well but uh my, my stay at whittier was was incredible it was a small department and i i would say that there was probably maybe 30 40 majors um and so we were really a tight-knit group what i loved about whittier it was a liberal arts and science university just like uh truman and um the the thing is all of us we would perform in the shows and we would also work backstage because we had to the department was so small and so uh i really was able to do uh a lot of great work there and, and honing my skills. Specifically, the, the thing about Whittier, they, they didn't have a theater on campus. And so whenever we did a show, it technically had a tour. It, we used the, uh, uh, the city uh, community center. And so uh, it was, we would build a set in the condemned gym, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, from there on uh, Sunday morning, we would take the set down, put it on a truck, get it over to the theater, put it back up. And then at that point, we'd take lunch and then come back after lunch to hang the lights and focus for that night to have our first tech rehearsal. And we would open the Thursday of that week. So we'd literally be in the theater just, you know, those three, four days before we perform. Then we close on that Saturday and Sunday morning, we'd all be back there to take the set down. So a lot of people would say, well, that, that's a whole lot of extra work and that, that's ridiculous. I mean, a lot of 
the uh, universities, colleges, they, they have a theater. They build their sets right there. But what that taught me, though, was how to tour a show. And when I started doing professional theater, it was so easy for me because I already knew the ropes that I need to, you need to build this smaller so it fits on a truck. I had uh, worked with one gentleman from, uh, I, I won't even say the university because I think that's unfair. Uh, but they had that same where you, you just build the set on the site. And we were building one of his shows uh, for professional theater. And it's like, uh, we were in the shop and it's gonna be toured uh, down down the street, or you know, in in LA, and uh, I was building one wall, and I said, you know, uh, this wall looks way too big. I think what we need to do is build this in two pieces. He says, no, 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 no. I want this to be one piece because it was all covered with brick. It's like, but we can cut the brick to and fit back, and nobody, no, no, no. It's like, okay. So we built this wall, which I think was like ten feet by fourteen feet. And when you put that on the back of a truck, even on its side, it's still 14 feet tall with the back road. And I remember driving this down to the theater and literally we had to stop with big sticks to push up the power line so the truck could go underneath. I know. It's a great idea. There's the crap out of me, but that's, that's what we did to get all the way down there. So, uh, when I started to design for this company, it was like, okay, we're never going to do that again. Because uh, obviously the designer wasn't with us when we were driving down the road and, and hoisting up these, uh, these, uh, the power lines. Uh, but it was, it was, it was, it was a really great education. Um, but yeah, what I wanted though is I'm, I, I'm, I'm heading towards the studio. This is, this is what I want to do. And uh, when I had graduated from Whittier, uh, I, I hit some of the, the, the studios right there, uh, but nothing was happening. And it was like, this was kind of getting scary because the first, first time since seventh grade, I wasn't doing any theater. It was really kind of, kind of strange. Um, I was working at a warehouse that, uh, I had to fill out orders for hardware stores. So I'd run up and down aisles, you know, grabbing hammers or nails, or whatever, filling the order, putting it in boxes and, and shipping it out. And uh, which was really kind of terrible work because I, th that's all I did for eight hours a day. Like it just didn't stop. Um, so I worked rather quickly uh, just to keep the time going. And I remember the people there would get really angry with me because when you're, you're working too fast, you're, you're getting too many things done and it's making us look bad. I'm sorry, I'm not going to just sit around because this is boring. Um, so I, I know that at one point I said, you know what, I, I'm going to go out to Universal Studios because I'd, I'd love to work there. So I, I went and um, I didn't have an appointment or anything. I didn't know who I was going to talk to. I just drove to the back where the back lot gate was. And uh, I sat in my car looking at how people were going in and out. And it, it appeared that they were just walking right in and giving a little wave, and they'd walk right in. So I thought, well, I can do that. So I had my uh, my resume with me, and I decided I'm going to get the gumption. I walk up to the gate and uh, wave to the guy. He waved right back, and I just walked right on in. It's like, holy crap, I'm in the back lot of Universal Studios, which was pretty awesome. But now I had... I didn't know where I was going. Yeah. <laughs> I had no idea. And so uh, I, I walked around and, and I finally found the mill shop uh, where they built the sets. And I had walked in and they were on a lunch break. And I said that I'd like to see, you know, guy in charge, foreman, whatever. And they said, well, he's not here. I said, well, here's my resume. I'm really interested. I, I'd, I'd love to work here. And they, they took it. They said, okay, well, we'll let you know. So uh, I went back out and I just said, well, I'm already in the back lot. I might as well walk around. <laughs> I kind of gave myself my own little tour. Um, but then I went back to that mundane job. And uh, it was uh, probably maybe a week or so. And I got a phone call. And uh, they said, uh, your mom called. 
And I said, uh, well, what's going is from Universal Studios? And I said, quit. I decided that was it. I'm just going to quit. I didn't even know what Universal wanted. But they're calling me. So I walked out the door. And uh, when I got home, I called them back. And they said they wanted me to start working in the mail room. I thought, I don't want to be a mailman. My resume is all about building sets and everything. So I thought that was really kind of stupid. And, you know, of course, I'm being stupid. <laughs> <laughs> and I said no, which of course that's the foot in the door. That's right. where a lot of people get their start is in the mail. And so it's like, oh man, that was really kind of idiotic. Well, you know, the things all fall into place for a reason. And uh it was soon after that where, you know, right when I had left college i was knocking on some of the regional theaters doors saying you know hi who this is my resume and um so the no takers nothing was happening but at least they knew who i was and i was meeting people um and then a friend of mine uh he was working for a commercial studio which that's all they did in the studio was just make commercials and he said you know we could probably really use your expertise because we need them that can build sets and that can run things technically, that can hang lights and do things like that. I said, yeah, I can do that. And so, and this was out in Culver City. So now I'm driving to Culver City, which from where I lived, I think it was only like maybe 30 miles, but with traffic, we're talking a two hour drive in LA because it was on the other side of LA where I lived. And so it was quite the drive. But I'd go out there and it was awesome. Uh, I really loved this, I had a good time, found out a lot about secrets of making commercials and what these advertisers do, which some of it I shouldn't say because it uh, seems pretty borderline illegal. Um, but I learned a lot. And one of the things that was happening, which I thought was strange is, uh, you know, they were renting sets for some of these commercials. And uh, some of them, the, the, the flats that they use, basically what we built, um, they would get like four or five of them and they would charge them like $2,000. And, and I told this, these, these people, I said, you know what? I could probably make this and we can keep it and it'd be like $200. And they said, well, well we really don't have the storage. I said, but even still, you're spending $2,000 for something that's ridiculous. So um, I said, well, fine, whatever, they're used to it. Uh, the money that goes in advertising is just insane to me, but you know, they have it, it comes from the, the clients, so I was gonna make that repeat. Um, and I worked there for quite a while, uh, probably about maybe, uh, I think it was like maybe three or four months, and uh, breaking in some new, a whole lot of good money. This, this was all worth it. I, and this is back, of course, in the 80s. And I was making like $800 a week in this, which was a whole lot of money back in the 80s. Um, so I felt really comfortable in where uh, I, I got engaged. My, my wife and I, we got engaged because like life is going really sweet. And, uh, I remember I got uh, called in um, and my boss at the time said, hey, hey, Ron, we were really hoping that maybe you could get here uh, in time uh, for breakfast so you can have breakfast with us. I said, what, what are you talking about? Well, yeah, I, you know, you get here at seven and we start work, but if you could get here a little bit early, we can all go to breakfast and we can have breakfast. It's like, I've got a two hour drive. Why? Not you want me to leave even earlier? I, I and just for breakfast? Have I ever been late? No, no, no. It's not about being late. It's like I'm, I just don't understand this. I so I'd rather not. I'd rather not have to get up earlier. Which then he said, "Well, then we're just gonna have to let you go." It's like what? Because I won't eat breakfast with you guys. <laughs> I mean, it made no sense to me. Uh, but apparently. That was it. I was done. I was going home. Well, 
Wait, were they were they having breakfast to let you go or something before everybody came in, or what was the? No, no, they want me just to come every day early so we can all, as a big group, go have breakfast and then go work on whatever the commercial was for the day. Hmm. Which, yeah, it made no sense to me because they all live locally. How they could do that? I wasn't gonna. So it's like, and I thought it was silly. Had nothing to do with my job or my performance. So I said no, and they said, well, then you're not a team player. We're gonna have to let you. I said, oh, well, this sucks because, you know, I just got engaged and now I don't have a job. So I got home and it's like, golly, this is really bad. And the phone rings and it's La Mirada Regional Theater calling me up and saying, hey, Ron, we, we need somebody to work down the theater. I wonder if you'd be interested. <laughs> Why, yes. <laughs> I happen to be in between jobs right now. And so I said yes. And it was like, wow, this is great. This is why, you know what? You keep knocking on the door. It's so important. And, and then it was like maybe a half hour later, I get another call. It's like, oh boy. And it's my boss from the studio. And he says, you know, Ron, that was stupid. I don't know what we were thinking. We, we don't want to let you go. That was um, So we'll see you tomorrow. And I said, ah, no, you won't. I said, sorry, I got another job. <laughs> and I hung up on him. <laughs> so that's when I started working for La Mirada Theater, which was a, a great experience because I was able to do a lot of different things there too as far as uh, – they had uh, four different uh, companies, theater companies that came into that space. One was the community theater, one was a Broadway series, one was a light opera, and uh, there was a fourth one I can't remember. But each of them had something that was going on throughout the whole year. So basically, I started working for all four of these companies. So during the day, I could be building sets for one company, and then that night, I'd be going in and running shows for the light opera and being a grip. So it turned out that this job was not like any other theater job because it was basically full time. And I remember when I first started working that uh, the, some of the guys, they called me Mr. College Boy because I learned <laughs> one thing you don't do when you get a new job say, oh, I have a college degree. These people don't <laughs> care. They, they don't care. So I was Mr. College Boy. Well, unfortunately for them, Mr. College Boy ended up being their boss because I slowly moved up the ranks. And uh, by the end of it, I was the technical director and the scene designer for two of the companies. And all the people that call me college boys, Bill Carpenters. And I was not their boss. But that's all right. I was still. Um, but this this worked out really great because it was a great group of people. And um, we were able to do things outside of the theater, which I thought was great. Uh, one one uh, guy, he had uh, started his own little company where he was building uh, sets and props for film and uh, television and wanted us, some of us, to help them out, which we did. And again, we were doing this on top of a theater job, so we always had a lot of good work happening. And um, one of the gigs we got into was uh, rock videos. Back in the 80s, that was all brand new. MTV, I can't remember when they first came out, but it was just around that time. So a lot of bands were trying for the very first time to put a rock video together. And so they didn't have a lot of money. They didn't know what they were doing. Uh, and there weren't a lot of people out there, companies that would say, oh, yeah, I'll do that for you. Um, so we got in with some of these really on the ground floor, which was great. So I got to work with big bands like, like Chicago and uh, ZZ Top, uh, the motels. Of course, I'm aging myself now because a lot of people don't know who ZZ Top. They're the guys with the beards. Um, and so we would... Uh, built these sets because we were technically a non-union house. And the union house, they, they didn't want to touch these rock videos. What are these things, you know? Uh, so we got a lot of great jobs out of that. And um, 
one of the big things, which I thought was really great too, was that's when I got to work with Tim Burton because he too was doing some side projects at the time when he was working at uh, Disney Studios. And so he was looking for groups that would be interested in helping him out. And so I did a, a small uh, film with Tim Burton, which was really great. Um, so all of that really was so exciting to be able to do all this really great stuff work with some great people. Um, some of the, the big stars that I worked with at La Mirada, because like I said, they had the Broadway series. They did one show, uh, gosh, I can't remember the name of it, but basically it was a musical review where uh, they were asking all of the uh, original performers of singers of major uh, musicals come in and sing their songs. And so it was like Tony Perkins who sang uh, uh, Try to Remember, uh, that's the name of the song from, uh, oh boy, from, uh, oh, I should have done my homework. Uh, you don't know where that's from? Try to, uh, try to remember it? the day in September. Ba -da -ba -da -ba. Oh, oh, okay, I know, yeah, I, know this, I can't remember what that's from either. Yeah, well, you know, he's, uh, he was the one who sang that originally. Um, uh, oh my gosh, uh, you can edit some of this out. Um, Trying to remember, uh, oh, uh, Debbie Reynolds. Okay. Uh, she was another one that was singing a song. And I thought it was pretty funny because she walked in the theater and there was a whole bunch of us, the guys were standing up against the pin rail. And she comes in and says, hello, hello. And she looked at me and she goes, well, hello, right to me. Like, well, hello. And I <laughs> she walked away and people, you know who that was? I said, yeah, that's Debbie. It's like, <laughs> and it was. It was. I, I wasn't lying. So uh, yeah, some of these people, it was really great to work with. Uh, Bette Midler was another one that I worked with. And uh, though it was exciting and I really kind of always kind of looked up to these stars, you know, what I really learned too at the time, they're, they're just people like you yeah. and me. Um, and uh, actually some of them were kind of divas. And it's like, oh, that's too bad. I really thought I was gonna like you and you're gonna be a really guy great person but I understand too you know sometimes because of the industry sometimes they they kind of push and they get pushed yeah. and so uh, I mean I don't fault them or anything like that um, but it was it was pretty exciting working with someone um, but then you know it it, it uh, a, a crossroads came into my life where um, my uh, alma mater, Whittier College, called me up and they asked if uh, I would be interested in teaching. Because they needed, so they were going to have a brand new theater built on campus for the first time. And they wanted to know if I'd be interested in being the, uh, the technical director and professor in theater, helping build the set and design. And it's like, okay, well, this is, this is a full time job. So do I go, you know, with with the theater thing that I've been doing? Because at the same time, it's one gentleman that started up this company doing all the commercials and stuff and the rock videos. He was going in a different direction, wanting to know if I wanted to take over the company. Which, um, you know, the, at the time, you know, Jenna, we've already had two kids. And I think she was pregnant again. Oh, no, just two. Um, and so it's like, you know what? I think I want to go with the more secure route um, with insurance and all that kind of wonderful stuff. And so that's when I started teaching for the first time. And part of that decision wasn't very difficult in that some of the people that I had worked with in the professional area, they didn't know what they were doing. It was really upsetting to me that, um, you know, their Uncle Bob or somebody got them a job, and so they're they're working. And uh, I thought that that was really unfair, and and I thought it would be much better that if I could use my skills in teaching young people how to really be a good carpenter or be a good technician, and then that way they can beat out the Uncle Bob's 
nephews and nieces. So, um, so that, that was, it was an easy transition for me to get into the classroom. And, uh, and of course, I absolutely loved it. Um, I loved being with all the fresh minds of just, of fill me with all the knowledge that you can. Um, and Eric, you know, I, I was pretty, uh, I could tell when a student really wanted to learn about technical theater and one that just was in the class because it was a required class. And, um, and I never pushed that. I never thought, you know, you better learn everything or, you know, and, and because to me, the big realm of the world, what does all that truly mean? Um, and so I, I really didn't push really hard on those that I knew will never, ever touch a hammer or a drill again. Although it was important they learn the basics, that they understood yeah. that this is what we do. And it's not easy. It's a lot of work. And um, the ones that enjoy it just make it seem easy to do. And, and um, so I, I, I really liked making sure that those who wanted to learn uh, got a little bit closer and I would give them different projects or more in-depth projects so that they could. And the ones that didn't care, well, they're the ones that could sweep the floor and that was all right. That had to be done as well. No, 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 no. <laughs> you know, I, honestly, I was, you know, uh, when I got there, I ended up under the wing of the, the director, the acting director, you know, like Al and John were, were really my mentors. Right. Um, but at the same time, you know, I spent, that was with you every day, you know, one, in one way or another. Right. Um, but then the people like, you know, Don, Don Crossley or Scott Nay, they were with you. You know, they were building sets 24-7, lighting, et cetera. So right. that, that's a, that point of view, I never thought about it, but you're right. You, you, um, you always, you did, you required us to people to, you got to learn it, right? Cause it's class. Right. But the, what you just said rings really true. Cause I don't remember, I don't remember any uh, of my theater professors one way or another that would, that would force you to do something. Um, but yeah, you're right. You, you didn't, you didn't do that. You just say, oh, another thing you just don't want me cause I'm not super technically adept. You don't want me putting putting uh, more than maybe one flat together, and then you can fix it when I leave the room. <laughs> well, and not you in particular, but that happens several times where it's like after class is over, it's like okay, there's a few things we need to fix here, which that was okay. That that was all yeah. right. You know, uh, again, I think what what was more important was the camaraderie. You you learn that this is a a team effort. And every job is important, even as small as sweeping the floor, that had to be done. And so um, if, if there was somebody that felt that they were better at that, by golly, yes, we'll put you on that. I remember uh, Dan Crum, you know Dan Crum. I mean, very talented technician, and, um, but he hated painting, despised it. And I knew that. And I knew that whenever it got to that point of the set, uh, phase, it's like, okay, I got to find something for Dan to do because he will not paint. And if he does, he will make a mess of it. So, um, yeah, I use him early on building and constructing. And uh, when we got to the painting, it's like, okay, you know what, Dan, I think why don't you put your efforts towards lighting because he was good at that. So he could get off the stage floor and get up into the catwalk and start hanging lights. And so, yeah, it, it's, it's a, a balance that we need to do. Uh, that I needed to do to make sure that the sets were all completed on time and with a little bit of quality and all that kind of stuff. And at the same time that everybody took something away from that. And in the last few years that when I was teaching, um, I started to do uh, teaching JBA, which is the Joseph Baldwin Academy. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Yeah. But uh -huh. it's the, the 15, 13 to 15 year old that uh, come in and I taught a course called uh, Theater on Stage and Off. And so for three weeks, these uh, young, young children, adults, uh, would be with me for six hours every day. And um, 
I broke the class off into uh, little sections where, you know, the first few days we're le learning uh, how to audition and doing monologues and just being aware of our presence and our bodies and all that kind of stuff. Because on the fourth day, they actually have an audition for a play that we were going to perform three weeks or two weeks from there. Awesome. And so everyone in the class got to be in the play if they chose to, or they would be backstage working on lights or sounds or special effects or whatever it was. Um, and, uh, and then of course, throughout the whole thing in the mornings, we would be rehearsing and, uh, or we'd be working on projects in the afternoons as well as rehearse. Uh, but the students, after all the three weeks were said and done, they were in a show and this show was produced with full costumes, makeup, lighting. I mean, the whole thing, um, it was pretty exciting because all their peers would come in and fill Severn's theater and they was like 200 us and uh they would all be sitting in and watching the show and they they just ate it up they loved it, it and even some of my uh colleagues were saying this this is what i look forward to uh the show you did last year was great i'm looking forward to which one you're doing this year so it was really kind of a compliment but you know the the biggest compliment i got out of all this i remember one kid he was a football player a 15 year old football player who knew the world he was a big tough guy. Uh, and I asked him, I think on the first day, he's like, what are you doing in this class? <laughs> you shouldn't be in this class. And he says, well, I wanted to try something different. It's like, okay, well, good for you. That's awesome. Yeah. And uh, so, you, you know, he got cast in the show, which he, he said, you know, I, I'd rather do something backstage. I said, well, you know what? The JBA was kind of tough because I'd always get like 17 women and three guys. And that was it. Just like, you're a man, you're male, you're going to be in play because I need. <laughs> so he was in the show. But it was at the very last day. And I, I was asking them, you know, about their experience and everything else. And, and, and he said, you know, Ron, I got to tell you, the one thing that I learned from this class is I learned I never want to do this again. But I really learned to appreciate what everybody does. Because being thrown into it, I had no idea. Even as an actor, memorizing those lines, that was really, really hard. And then the blocking, and then putting on my makeup, and then, I mean, and he went on and on. Uh, so to me, I think that was probably, that's what I want. I want, if, if, if I can, let a 13 or 15 year old person know that I've had this opportunity and I've done it. And now I know I should never do it again. I think that's great. Yeah. Cause I think there's a lot of people that come into college that think this is what I want to do for the rest of my life, but they've never had the opportunity to really experience it. And now they're in college and they're making a, a, a this is my major. So I can't back out of it. So I got to, and now when they graduate, it's like, and it, nothing comes of that. And so if I can make someone at that age figure out, okay, that was exciting. I want to go watch it, but I never want to do it. I think that was, that was something that was really worthwhile. So. And I think what you said, he, he learned how to appreciate what everybody else, you know. Yeah. He learned that it takes talent for any job, right? You know, the, right. the guy running McDonald's or or the person that's a teller at a bank, or the person that's a CEO, but whatever. They've got a specific right. talent. We're all just people. Even Debbie Reynolds was just a person, but she had a talent that to entertain, you know, millions of people. So Right, right. Um, and so find what that is and then go with it. Right. Yeah. And right. I, I'm picking up, I'm, I, get, I get chills when you told me that story. I, I'm, I'm just picking up from you. And this is not surprising how much you love um, teaching and developing and, and working with really kids, you know, even when we were you know, a 20, a 21, 22 year old kid as a kid. Yeah. Um, and you, you're saying people, I get it, but you know, so go back. So you, you went back to Whittier and I, and I, I'm guessing you got your master's and started running the department and with that, is that how that went? How that went was, yeah, we, we started to, um, 
talk about the, the construction of the theater and which I was told at that point once that happens because at the time I was just an adjunct professor I was only teaching the one course and uh designing so I wasn't an assistant professor an associate or anything like that I was just adjunct however when the theater was built then you would become you know a a professor I said okay that's great and he said however in order to do that you need to get your master's because I did I just had my BA and so um, I started going to uh, Cal State Fullerton uh, to work on my MFA. So at the time, of course, I'm married with uh, two kids and I'm working as an adjunct professor at Whittier. I was still working at uh, La Mirada doing the stuff that I could there. Plus now I'm going to school full time. And this was, yes, a pretty rocky time in our marriage as I was barely home. Um, and if I did come home, it was either to work on a thesis project or to go to sleep. And so, uh, and as you could tell, you know, the, uh, not a whole lot of money was coming in. And so, uh, you know, Jenna, she was working, uh, babysitting and doing whatever she could to help also bring in money. So it, it was, it was up. But we were looking at the end of the, the rainbow there. It's like, this is, you know, once this is all done, the theater's built, I'm set. Um, and it came to the point where, uh, yes, I, I got my degree and now they're searching for, uh, people to fill this role, which I'm smug and saying, well, I know it's mine. I've been told by my, my colleagues here that this job is going to be mine. But unfortunately, the dean of the university had a different plan and, uh, he wanted to have a well-rounded uh, faculty, just like the students. The students were very diverse. They come from all over the world at this private college. And so he wanted the same thing about the faculty, get somebody not as grown right here in town, but from elsewhere. And uh, my, I'm a colleague at the time was saying, no, 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 you don't understand. You know, we've, We've told Ron, basically, this is the job. He went off to get his MFA. He's been working really diligently to get this, knowing that it's, you know, it's like, sorry, but it's not going to happen. And uh, I guess he got really upset and said a few things, which he got very upset. The students found out, and uh, they went and had a sit-in at the dean's office which I thought was, that was just so great. It made me just feel so great. That, um, they, they all got together and, and did that for me. Which then the dean came back and said, all right, Ron can apply for the job, but I don't want to hear anything more from you or from them students. So I went in for an interview, which by the way, the dean wasn't even there. He showed up the last five minutes. And based on the last five minutes that he spent with me, he told everybody on the committee that I was I didn't get it. And now this is April, I believe it is, which is really late in the year to be looking for a teaching position at a college. It usually happens way earlier. So I remember I came home and I was very upset because I at the end of this year, I don't have a job. And all that I, we were working for is gone. And uh, I was telling Jenna in the backyard, and I remember I was, I was crying. And uh, Heather, who was five, my eldest at the time, we asked why, why is daddy so sad? And uh, Jenna said, well, it's just money situation. And I remember Heather said, well, he could have all the money in my piggy bank. Then go, oh my God. <laughs> oh, because by this time, uh, all three kids, Ronnie was born too. So we had three kids and I didn't have a job. And uh, so, of course, first thing we do is we start sending out resumes. Every day. And, uh, you know, I have a very close family. You know, we're all in California and Jenna has a very close family. And it's like, so I'm looking for jobs in California which I'm getting no bites and it's like, okay, let's expand a little more. Let's go, you know, up the coast a little bit and 
uh, but still nothing. It's like, okay, well, just so finally, after you know, a month of nothing, we're we're going to the East Coast now. We we've got resumes everywhere, and then uh, we get the call from Northeast Missouri State University, and they want me to come out and interview. And uh, it's in Kirksville. It's like I don't even know where any of this is. <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard of this place, and it's like, but that's okay. Um, I remember I landed in a cornfield and we're driving it's like oh my god what have i done but they're interested in me so this is good good job uh i go in i meet al and doc and uh i'm showing my portfolio and one of the first things that really scared me was uh al looked at it and said hey this kid can draw <laughs> i'm the designer <laughs> the designer is supposed to be able to draw uh, so they uh, they you know talked with the dean, with the president, the vice president of the university, and that day they said the job is yours uh, if you want it. And so uh, I called Jenna, and uh, she was having a Christmas around the world party in July, which I thought was interesting. Um, and I said I got the job, and we're we're moving to Kirksville. And she's crying and like Kirksville, and somebody I heard in the background, where the hell is that? <laughs> uh, so yeah, that that's when it happened. It's like what year was that? That was in '87. Okay. Yeah. So uh, that's when uh, we decided we're 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 moving to the Midwest. And you know the thing that was really great about it when I did land in that cornfield, uh, all the smells. Of the Midwest came back to me. I'm from Chicago, and I lived in Illinois until I was eight, and so uh, I remember the Midwest. And moving to LA and living in Los Angeles for 25 years uh, with the smog and everything else, you know, you forget some of those smells. And so when I got out here, it's like, wow, this is bringing me back someplace. And it almost felt like this, this is my home. This makes sense to me. Um, and when I got to the campus and I was fortunate that I was able to meet some of the students that were here during that summer. And I met Dan Crum at the Dukum at the bar. <laughs> and, uh, I, I, I got to know him pretty well that night. It's like this guy, just asking and talking to him, he knows a lot about tech theater. It's like, they, they've got some pretty top-notch people. And so I felt really comfortable about moving out here. And 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 it, like I said, and even at the time it's for me too, it's like this is a stepping stone. This we're gonna be here three, five years. That's it. Because I can't I we I need to get a job. I need the job. Uh, but we need to, you know, plant ourselves for a little bit so we're just not jumping from job to job. So know that we can be here three to five years and then we get back to where our family is. Um, but I tell you, you know, the longer we were here, the more invested and it's just, the the thing that kept us out here, it, it was the students, it was you guys. Um, and Truman attracts such really great, bright individuals that it was hard just to say, to, to, to walk away from that. Um, so, for me, it was an easy decision to stick around. What worked out great for Jenna and the kids was this was a really little great neighborhood to grow up in. Jenna had so many opportunities doing different things in town that she would have never had in, in LA. And so uh, we come to really love this town. In fact, it got to the point where if ever we were gonna move someplace, it's like we need to get someplace that has the four seasons. We love the snow. We love, you know, complaining about the heat in the summer, knowing that come winter we're gonna get cold and then we can complain about the cold so we can have the heat. It was, but there, it's just what we do. And so, uh, yeah, we really grew to, to love this, this place. Um, and it, it wasn't an easy decision to, to retire. It was just that my, my body was telling me it was time. Um, I know that in, was it 2015, um, I had a, um, 
ruptured disc in a C3, C4 rupture. And so uh, they had to do surgery, and uh, which is really interesting because uh, they, they fused the two discs together. And apparently, uh, the way they did that, I was under. I wasn't or not. But they, they, they grab here, they cut here, and they pull the larynx, everything over. And then they, yeah, yeah. And the, the, the funny thing was, uh, as uh, they're, they're shooting me up with the rug and I'm going under, they said, you know, what do you do for a living? Uh, I, I'm a theater technician. Oh, so you don't have to sing? No. <laughs> well, come to find that's why, because they're pulling this away. And <clears throat> even to this day, I still, it's like I'm always having to clear my throat. Um, so, but that was one thing. And then uh, it was uh, two years after that, that had a little mishap at the house here where uh, I was uh, doing some uh, chimney sweeping of my chimney, our little wood stove here. And when I was coming down the ladder, the ladder slipped out from under me. And I came crashing down right on on my back. And um, it was so fortunate. Uh, my daughter, who was from, now lives in Tennessee, was out visiting and um, was in the house. Heather, my older daughter, is coming to visit Sarah because she's in town. Heather pulls up. She heard the bang of the ladder and me fall. And um, which, of, of course, I could not say anything. Oh, the wind was knocked out of me. So I'm back there going, <laughs> and nothing's coming out. Um, so I start to bang on the wall because it was right that where my, my daughter was. She's in this room, and I'm pounding on the wall. Heather walks in saying, where's Matt? Oh, he's in the backyard banging on something. And because she heard the ladder. She went running out and she saw me on the ground and she starts screaming, call 911, which struck me and I found out that I broke my back. So, like, okay, this is not good, you know, with a broken back. Um, and that was in October. I was back at work the, that same spring semester. You know, I've had, every, it was amazing. You know, they just put the little harness on me. I had no surgery, which was great. I was able just to heal without that. Um, and so then it was the, the three months after that when I had my heart attack. Um, and that was scary because uh, that was a final dress rehearsal for one of our shows in April. And um, I was coming into the theater and just walking into the theater, I was starting to get winded, which was weird but then i thought well you know what this is crunch week i've been working really hard all week to get the set done so sure that's what it was and so when i got in the theater i was about to sit down somebody up in the booth had said we're having troubles with the sound so i went running up to the booth and when i got there it's like oh my god you know running upstairs and i was winded and i remember meredith and meredith i apologize i'm apologizing to you here in front of everybody um, I said she was the cause of my heart attack, and that's not true. That we were just, I was joking, but I don't think I've ever really said, you know, that that, that was a joke. That's a joke. Um, she, she was saying maybe we need to get somebody else to help with this. Like, no, no, I can get it, which I did, and I fixed it. And then I sat back down in the theater, knowing I, 10 minutes before the curtain was going up for our final dress, and then I started feeling nauseous. But then it'd go away. It's like, oh, well, because I ate and I run, come running in here. So I'm making all these excuses. And so I subside, but then I come back and I subside. And it's like, you know what? I'm just going to go outside and get a little bit of fresh air. So I walked out. And as I was walking out, I could feel the pain in my left arm. It's like, okay, I got the heavy chest. I can't breathe. I'm getting nauseous. I got it. So what do I do? I drive home <laughs> and I get home. And of course, uh, Jen is not home because she is doing uh, her own show at the community theater. And uh, she had come home probably, it was about 10 minutes after I had gotten home. 
And she's, what, what, what are you doing? She knew it was my final dress. Yeah, yeah, I just wasn't feeling very good. So I thought I just, she goes, you look terrible. Get in the car. We're going to the hospital. So we did. And that drive, it started to really hurt. And when we got into the ER and they're doing everything. And I remember very well the doctor saying, well, Ron, the good thing is you're not having a heart attack. Hey, I don't know what I'm having. They're giving me the uh, all the drugs it's supposed to make all of this go away, and it's not going away. It's getting worse. And at one point, somebody said, because it's really kind of here and there, but somebody said, "Have them do a posterior PPP," which they did. And they flipped me over. And they started doing that, and it was like immediate. Get them into the OR. And so, so fortunate at the time that we had a, a doctor, a cardiologist that was a resident in town and they called him up and it was within you know that hour that i was you know having this stent put in and it was the lad which is apparently the widow maker as they call it and typically i think they said 96 percent of the people that have this i was so very lucky they had mentioned too that if Dr. Shima was not in town and they had a fly me to uh, Columbia. I probably wouldn't. Wow. I feel so, so blessed and, and happy that all the people were here that needed to be here at that time. Um, but see, this is my body telling me maybe, maybe it's time to, to hang it up. And um, so um, that's, that was part of the Let's enjoy so, our retirement. Yeah, so let's go let's, a little bit. You, you mentioned the Joseph Baldwin Academy is something you've really enjoyed in the last three years, but over, over the time, what, you, know, you, bet you were there, how long were you there? 33 years? 31, 31. Mm -hmm. So what were the, what are, what, what's something that sticks out to you? What, what are, and I know that that's going to be a long list and you know, we don't, yeah. you'll probably talk all day, but what, what are the things that you really enjoyed or something that stuck out to you during that time? Well, something that is just so incredible to me and still is to this day was having that opportunity to work with John Schmore. The, he, as a director, was able to inspire me to do, I think, my best work. And I don't know what it was. He doesn't know what it is. I, I've talked to him about this. Um, but the two of us together was just, I think someone had mentioned it at the, the retirement party. It was magic. That, that, whole, that whole time, uh, it was just magical because um, theater, we did some really good theater and it, we worked with some really great people. And I think a lot of great people came out of that era. Um, and I'm not saying that that didn't follow down the path when John left, but I, I just remember working with him and as a director, he was just, just so phenomenal. Um, and so I, I think that's one of the things that really stands out. The other thing that I think stands out was, uh, I think one of my favorite shows was uh, when I did uh, Jekyll and Hyde, the musical. Um, because you know, when I was hired, I was not hired to be a director. And uh, I remember some of my colleagues at the time getting rather upset when I believe it was uh, Derek Donovan. Were you here with Derek Donovan? Yeah, I knew Derek, yeah. Uh, and I believe he was the one who uh, came to me and said, we need to create a secondary uh, series of shows to do outside of the main stage. And outside the lab show, and that's when we created Project Two. I don't know if you remember that or not. Project Two. Mm -hmm. Not there, or you just don't remember. I don't remember. It's yeah. Um, and the idea behind Project Two was that no one that was ever cast in a main stage could audition for a project because he felt, and I'm inclined to agree with him a little bit, that 
uh, some of the directors kept using the same people over and over and over. And some of the other ones that really wanted to get on stage never got that opportunity. So if we created this project too, uh, the secondary series where the students would get the opportunity to get seen, then perhaps then they can move up and onto the main stage. Uh, and I believe that that was around for about five years. But as I was doing this, I did this not as something that I felt I needed to accomplish in my life. I did this because it was a need for the students. And so I was just trying to fill this need. And uh, so I stepped in as a director for it because, you know, Jim and Al were busy doing the main things. Come to find out that they was kind of like trying to backfire on me and that they felt that I was trying to take over their jobs and I wasn't even doing my job. Which is like, I don't know what you're talking about. This has ever been not finished, or did I not, you know? So I don't even know where it came from. Well, I do. I the the person that was hired for me, um, apparently he had this really nice resume of set construction and pretty pictures, and uh, come to find out that he had taken them from a colleague and that he didn't know how to design anything, but he just wanted the job so he could become a director. Wow. And so apparently they felt yeah, I was doing the same thing, which of course was. Um, so when I started to, to direct, uh, I, I felt that not only am I feeling a need for the students, but I'm also giving them one more opportunity where, to work with somebody different. And the more, uh, an actor can work with all different types of directors. You're just molding them, be prepared for all sorts of things when they're leaving here. So um, I thought that this was a good thing. And of course, as soon as um, uh, Lee and uh, John got here, they too saw that need and that this was great. And so this is when, you know, I started uh, to direct a little more frequently, but I never got a musical because those were always, you know, uh, somebody else's. And apparently, uh, I don't know if I was worthy. I, I had been in a lot of musical, um, in the piano, I, <laughs> I can sing, except not anymore because of the operation. Um, but when I finally got to direct a full, main stage musical. I did uh, Bat Boy, the musical. And I don't know if you're familiar with Bat Boy, the musical. Mm -mm, no. Oh, it's, it's a beautiful play. And it's based off of that, um, I don't know if you remember long ago, the National Enquirer, it had that picture of that Bat Boy found in a cave. <laughs> it's this hideous picture. Uh, and so it's based on a, this, this boy that was abandoned and uh he grew up with the bats and so uh hmm. they find him and they bring him into their home and to teach him and it's it's, it's a lovely little musical um but that was the first one i had done and i really enjoyed it and it was very successful um and my second one was then uh the uh, jekyll and hyde musical which seemed bigger and grander and i mean it was a cast of had to have been close to 30 people and um, it was it was wonderful. Um, I remember uh, my a colleague at the time. We had a president, a president uh, Pano, Troy Pano, a wonderful guy. He was so much fun. Um, in fact, at his inauguration, you know, they always put the, the little uh, medallion on on the the president's neck when he is inaugurated. Mm -hmm. And his first words is, oh, Pano's got some bling. <laughs> okay, now this is what the guy was. I mean, he was just a really wonderful person. Um, and he would come to see every one of our shows, which I thought was just fantastic. And uh, I remember there was a time when um, there was a little bit of uh, worry that maybe because uh, there was a lot of cuts going on and maybe the theater department was going to be cut. And um, so uh, 
Troy came to the department and we had a big department meeting with all the students and faculty. And he wanted to assure us that theater was not going to be cut. That this is a liberal arts and science university. And those kind of things are not going to happen. Trying to make us feel, which it, and um, had a colleague at the time there, and had asked, uh, so what's your your favorite show that you've seen? And because uh, this particular person was working on a show, or had just closed the show, and he said, well, to be quite honest, I think uh, I mean I like them all, but I think the one I liked the most was uh, Jekyll and Hyde the musical, and all that one. And I'm just like, oh, I didn't ask for it, but that sure was nice to hear. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I think, uh, yeah, that those those moments with John and then working with musicals uh, were were some of the highlights. Um, I, I, you know, you're right. There's probably so many more um, that that I I, I don't want to. You know, hurt anyone's feeling if I had told them at one point, oh no, yours the one that was, because they are, they, they always ask, you know, what's your favorite show? And I always say, well, the one that I'm working, on, that's my favorite right now. Yeah. Um, because they all, they all have something so great. I don't think I ever worked on a show that I couldn't stand. Why would I do that? So. Yeah, you said John Schmore, I always felt like John had a, had a really great collaborative method of doing just about everything he did he didn't just come in and throw the book down and say do it this way if you right. if you came with an idea he would listen to it you may not agree with it but he'd listen right. and, have a, and give it real consideration and i think that was a big um not just big for you but big for students to see that right. and it's probably been an impact in my life more than i really think about so yeah right well i remember like because he would do the devised ones and um when when the program was built it wasn't by john schmore it was by every single student that worked on the device piece it wasn't his it was theirs and i i love that in him that yes he was guiding them all but they're the ones who wrote the script they're the ones who brought the characters they're the one who brought the story and um so I, I always thought that, that was just one of the greatest things about him is, is he wasn't doing theater for himself. He was doing theater for the students. Yeah. And I think that's, that's what college theater should be. You know? So. Yeah. So, okay, this is <clears> awesome. <throat> I'm, I want to, you still got a little time. I want to take you through a little exercise. Okay. Okay. So, um, and we'll, we'll wrap it up with this, but. So let's say I want to put on uh, Hamlet. Okay. And, and it's, you know, everybody knows Hamlet. We move on. So how far, so the first question is, how far ahead do you and I need to start talking about putting this set together? Because we need, you know, we need the court. We need, uh, we need a graveyard. We need, a, um, we need catacombs, I believe. We need a bedroom. We need like a... Uh, where the garbage sit at the top of the kit. We need a whole lot of stuff for this set. So how how much advanced time would you need to start to be building that and talking about it and designing something like that? For, let's say for the for the big stage on you know, the biggest stage on campus. Right, right. Well, you know, I, we actually did Hamlet. I don't know if you knew that or not, but uh, I had just done it within like the last five years now. I want to say because it was one of the later ones that I worked on. Um, and I think, again, it has a lot to do with the director on how much time that I need for the, that thought process, that design process to happen. Um, through my years, I've had the opportunity to work with a lot of different directors. And there's a lot of directors that have no idea what they want. And then there's a, some directors that know exactly and I can't tell you which is better to work because sometimes when they don't know what they want, you may be going back and forth to the drawing table many, many times. Or if there are the few that say, I don't know what I want, and you bring something, it's like, oh my God, I never even imagined that. that is, that's magical to me. Yes, let's use this. 
where there's others that I think are lying to you and they say, I don't know what I want. And they keep sending you back because I think they knew exactly what they want and I just wasn't there. And yes, and then which falls in that category of those who know exactly what they want, but they pretend not to. And it's just like, uh, and, and I had done this with the director too, where it finally after the fourth time, it's like, stop it. Tell me what you want and I'll give it to you. Um, but I'll be honest with you too. I will not put my name in the program as a designer. I'll put you down as a designer and I will be, you know, your technical director and your shop foreman and everything else. But if you know exactly what you want, tell me and I'll do it and then we'll, we'll get through it. Something like Hamlet, yeah, we, we want we want to have a good amount of opportunity to have a chat, talk about concepts and what it is that you really want to see. What, what are the themes that you want to push? Uh, locations, obviously, uh, are, are things that we can deal with so quickly. In fact, the one that we did just do, um, I designed it with uh, these big flowing pieces of material that draped all over the state for lighting purposes, because we could hit light on them and it was just gorgeous. But the other thing that we were able to do is we were able to have the actors in these scene changes grab one of these panels under their arm, walk across the stage and put it on something. And now we have this new huge thing and this coming here. And so easily we could just transform the stage to whatever we want. And by putting the right lighting on it from the right direction, we can make this, you know, out in uh, where the grape site is, or we can make this, you know, wherever. Um, and, and so I think that's one of the key things is, uh, especially in Shakespeare or in any musical, we got to make sure that this show travels and it's smooth travel. We are going from the scene to the scene, to the next scene, to the next scene. And we don't want this clumsy, we got to stop now break all the audience and say bump 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 and change this no it's got to be the transitions have got to be so smooth and i think as a designer it's really my job to make sure that this type of thing can come that that uh, that it can easily be shifted which i don't know i think that's what i love about the liberal education because you know what uh, as a scene designer, I have to know what it's like to be a director. I need to know what it's like to be an actor. I need to know what it's like to be all these things, to put myself in these places so I can visualize how this can actually take place. Because um, unfortunately, those who are just scene designers, oh, it's pretty. You'll figure out how to make the change. Okay, well, but then your, your design might be compromised. So. Um, so being able to design it in that way where it's full flowing and um, and it is, it's up to me as a designer to show the director all the different looks. Um, what we had actually done with this last one is the, the costume designer was going a whole complete route with uh, each scene uh, or act, it was by act. Uh, the costumes would change color. And the way that they were looking at this is when the royalty are wearing their red costume outfits, so too will the rest of the town. And so I made these banners that were hanging that were on these posts that were all the flowing material was. And we had one that was red, we had one that was gold, we had one that was black, we had one that was blue. And depending on where they were in the play, those were hit with a light. So now, oh, we're in our red face. All the costumes are red. This was red. And it was like, it was a beautiful flow, the set, the costume action. And so um, that's when, you know, theater all comes together nicely. Awesome. Well, the play's the thing, right? Absolutely. Somebody said that. I don't know I, who that was. <laughs> maybe in that play. Um, <laughs> so, uh, Last little thing, and and we can we can uh, wrap it up here. We're getting we're getting over an hour, but I'm I'm loving. I guess you're, I'm sure you could talk all day too. But um, I know, I know, and I've been talking a lot. I'm sorry. I'm sure no, you have a lot more questions. Okay, it's your story, man. It's your story. I, I that's we're here to hear about you. Nobody cares about me. So okay. <laughs> what? So if 
first I'll just open it up and say, if, if you got anything you'd like to say about, about what you did, where that's fine, do that. But also, if someone was come, came to you, a former student or just somebody you knew, and they were thinking about taking this up as a profession, becoming a, you know, a professor, maybe even just in general, you know, for whatever their specialty was, mm -hmm. um, what would you say to them? And then what else do you have to add to what, whatever we've talked about? Well, I got to say, I think, especially my area, uh, being a technical director and a scene designer, I think one of the strongest things about my background was I did it for real. I didn't just come out of a MFA program, book smart, and just started to teach. I, I, I was out there. And so I think that that has made me a better professor in that I know what it's like, first of all, to be there. So when people are saying, hey, what's it like? I can tell you exactly what it's like. Um, yes, I can tell you about the pitfall, things to look out for. Don't go and say that you you got a college degree. <laughs> I'll just call you Mr. College. <laughs> um, so there, there's, and plus I think it just rounds me out more. It, it, it gives me a better understanding of what it is that the students need to prepare themselves for. Um, we're on a whole different level. And I think that's what's really important for um, colleagues and universities to understand. You know, you've got high school, then you've got college, and then you've got, you know, your uh, regional theater, and then you've got, you know, Broadway. You know, each on our own layer. And I think what's most important is that we don't lose what it is that you're trying to learn at this level. Um, and and, and I, I, I got a little upset with my master's program in that they were pushing so many of the uh, set pieces to be animatronic. They, they, they had uh, all these wenches and everything. So someone backstage could push a button and that would push this out. Another button swung this around. And yeah, that's exciting. And, uh, but at the same time, what are the students learning? I know for a fact they weren't putting all these things together to see them. They just came in to push the button. And so for me, it's like, you know, at this level, Let's have the ropes. Let's let's pull this. I need three people backstage to move this and to do that sort of thing. Because not only do you get down and dirty, which is really great, but you have to learn the tempo of the show. You have to know that, yes, we're turning a turntable. It's got to move at this pace for this scene, but it's got to move faster for this one. So you get to really understand how a show needs to flow. Um, and also you begin to own it. All of a sudden, so this is really important. This is not just me backstage pushing a button. I, I think it's great that we have these computerized light boards now that do 255 fades simultaneously. I don't know when you ever need that, but they can do it. But, but there's something lost though in that that, that operation of really being a part of the show. You know, I, I, I date myself again, when, when I was in college, we had, uh, and we thought this was really the bomb. It was, you know, a four scene preset. But we had actually four layers that we could set. And then we could just go A or B or C or D. And while we're in C, we're re-changing A. So when we go back to A, it's a whole new scene. And we thought that was great. But at the same time, we still had two people running the lights. Someone would change the A's and the B's, and the C's, but while somebody else is changing all the other stuff. Where now it's, you know, one monkey pushing the button because that's all preset during tech. When nobody else is there but the director and the technical director and the light designer, and they're putting in all these things, and the cast comes in and it's like, oh my God, it's magic. Yes, the magic fairies took care of all of this. Um, and so I think a lot of that gets lost. At the same time, Dirk, I know it's beautiful. 
there, there's some really wonderful things that are, are being done today because of the lighting, because of the LED lights that are now, I mean, it's just awesome. Um, and yes, we need technology. We need to progress. We need to go forward. But at the same time, let's not lose it all. Let's, let's still learn about the, the, where we came from and, and try to make what we have at this level as exciting so the next step up, they, they want to learn more instead of I'm just going to do it because I know how. And you guys will, you'll see next week when it's done. But that doesn't work. Um, I don't know. I don't, it's the, the, the things that I, 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 I miss, I think, are the, the, the students, working with the students. Um, seeing that light bulb go off on somebody, uh, good or bad, you know, oh, this is what I want to do. Oh, nope, this is not what I want to do. Um, but uh, just having that, that, the camaraderie again, I use that word a lot, but I think it's, it's exactly what it is because um, we're all in it together. And so I, I, I'm going to miss, I miss that already the most. Um, I was very fortunate because as soon as I had retired, um, I, I started to direct a show for the community theater and having a ball working with uh, people that I, I think are just really, really fun and talented. Uh, but unfortunately, this pandemic hit and oh, yeah. uh, we, we were, I think it was like uh, four weeks out and we had to say, nope, we, we're not going to be able to do this. So. But it's still it's still on the the the, the shelf there. So we're going to be able to once this all goes away. Uh, if the cast is still around, I still want to be able to do it. So. Awesome. Well, speaking as someone who is more focused on the acting and directing side of things, I remember pulling ropes for you at some point. I, <laughs> I think I was <laughs> I think I was pulling wood uh, pulling ropes and into the woods backstage. So oh okay yeah. yes yes yeah talk about a lot of moving parts. Yes. Um, cows flying in and stuff. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, I, this is awesome. I really appreciate you taking the time to talk. And, and I think that, um, I know that you, you had the impact that you wanted to have. So you, you positively impacted a lot of lives and a lot of students. And so you should, uh, you should be proud of that. And, and, um, well, thank you. And, and it, when I heard, that there was a um, scholarship in my name. The moment I heard that, the feeling that I got, the best way to describe it is, is as if all of you students at one time gave me a big hug. So, all right. One of the things that I, I'm sorry, one of the things that I always look forward to was a poem at the banquet, writing that poem and, and doing the poem. And um, it was unfortunate because the last few years, because I was going into surgery or I had to miss a semester or whatever, uh, I, I, I had stopped doing them because I wasn't there. How could I write about the shows if I wasn't even watching? So I kind of missed out on, on those in the last few. But the way that I always ended them, which I still think is so important is, you know, for what we do, you know, so many people, I want the money, I want the fame, I want whatever. But I always told you, which was the most important was just make sure whatever you're doing, just make sure you're having fun. That's, I think, the most important thing. Because then it really doesn't matter all the other stuff. And uh, I was fortunate in my life to be able to do something because of all you guys, where every day I got to go to work and I got to have. And that was, a, I think, all you guys. Well, thank you, Ron. Or, all right, thanks for your time today. And uh, yeah, this has been awesome. Thanks for sharing the stories. Well, thanks for having me. All right. it, we'll good. see you sometime soon. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs>